We have an insanely good VFX department this season, and, and uh, they outdid themselves. There are lots of things in the book that we, we loved, and Rainer, our visual effects supervisor, said it was something that he knew he could do up to his own insanely uh, exacting standards. They all know exactly what everything's meant to look like, which is incredible. I don't know how they do. That's what I saw in the books when I was reading it, and it was just even more amazing than what I imagined. Our mission was, let's make things grander, let's make things cooler. We knew we had some creatures we had to create with computer graphics. We knew we had the Dark Wolves, but we had to help in, in some way. And uh, overall, the goal was to add scope, add production value, and help create this fantasy world and make it epic. Visual effects like costumes, like production design, like music, is something that supports and lends uh, additional information to an additional production value to the show and so it was really important to Dan and David that we be able to have a lot of scope to be able to see things that couldn't be brought in front of the camera without visual effects. Uh, castles, fantasy elements like dragons and inky creatures that would emerge and become characters of all their own. No! Creating a new world starts with concept art. It's a collaboration between the art department and visual effects, and we uh, start sketching and create some beautiful illustrations that show ultimately what it will be. We do previs, which is almost a video game-like animation that approximates the environment we'll be living in and to show everyone while we're shooting so they can see what we're doing. It helps us knowing where the camera angles are and where and how to build a green screen. Um, it also shows us within a cut what we know we're going to be adding stuff into later. We're actually able to see the sequences so we're not left in the dark. As you can see we're completely surrounded by green screen. Everything else is going to be added after we've done our, our little bit here. So to, uh, to be able to see on the laptop exactly where the sequence is going, you can adjust yourself accordingly. So it's not as bad as some people think that you're just acting against a, a green wall. <gasps> there are a number of characters that are not people this year. We have dragons and we have dire wolves and we have a, uh, an inky birth. And coming up with a look for those things is very much uh, a collaboration. We discussed with, with Dan and David that for the way it should move or the material it was made of, we would use ink in water as a, as a reference, the way that uh, ink spreads in, in water. and. Uh, thought it would be nice if the, the shadow creature creates and then disintegrates while it is moving through space. It's more of a fluid motion. We used a humanoid body underneath a lot of fluids in. Uh, so we used this human creature to then emit fluids. So it was all lots of different fluid simulations on top of each other. At some point we, we tried out playing fluid simulation backwards so that things are coming together rather than they dissolve. In pre-production, we discussed how we would approach the Dire Wolves. Ghost, stay with us! Ghost! There were lots of different ideas. Of course, one of the ideas was to make the Dire Wolves CG creatures. But in the end, we, we decided on shooting with wolves, but of course you can't shoot with wolves and, and actors. We shot the dire wolves as separate elements on this green screen stage so that we were able to take them out of the set and out of the day-to-day -day actor performance environment. We were able to shoot with a stuffy. We have a giant stuffed animal wolf that we would bring into the set when we were shooting with the dire wolves and they would be there for lighting reference, they would be there to help set the camera and show everybody just how big these suckers are and where they would be in screen space when we're shooting with them. We were able to recreate the light situation we had on the set and rebuild parts of the set to later shoot it again on a stage with the wolves in it. We got very lucky sometimes with some of the behaviors, you know, because when you're working with animals, they're very unpredictable. 
and uh, there's a scene where the dire wolf first walks into the stockade where he passes Rob and we had standing in the position of Rob one of the Wranglers in a green screen suit and something on the Wrangler's suit kind of gave him a moment and he kind of just gives him a sniff as he's walking by and it looks like he's doing that to Rob and it just tied it all together so beautifully and sometimes you have these little happy accidents. So one of the things we did with the dragons for season two was we looked at it with an eye of what it would be when it grows up. We have this dragon that's now more mature. So what we did was we started from what would these dragons look fully grown? And then we sort of backed off from there to the age that they are now, giving them the sort of qualities that would kind of foreshadow where they will be. We did a redesign on these dragons. Hopefully it's not too obvious. We changed the proportion slightly. We changed the detail, the textures. There's a new muscle system that is being used. Because the dragons, they breathe fire in, in this season. So we wanted them to be a little bit more fierce. Also, the, the shots that we have, some of them were quite challenging. Like in, in episode one, we see Danny walking through the desert and she is miming that a dragon is sitting on her shoulder. We have a dragon that's been fabricated on her costume. We shoot a take with it, and then we shoot a take without it, so she knows roughly, you know, where to look and how how it's supposed to behave. It's so funny because we have the um, we have the models, the scale models that we work with uh, the, for the sort of the camera rehearsals prior to them leaving, and then they're just being kind of empty air. But um, I'm getting a real like real connection with them. I know this sounds a little a little crazy. I'm taking a little method, but uh, they're my babies. All the dragon shots we created previous before we set out to shoot them. And uh, then after we got the material, we had to match move them. So you have to find where the camera was. You have, you have to kind of bring the plate in a 3D space. And then we have to track her shoulder, her head. And of course, if there's a mismatch, then it would look like the dragon would be sliding on her shoulder and it wouldn't look believable. He didn't tell you what kind of me. My brother didn't know anything about dragons. For the Red Waist, Dan and David had very specific ideas how they wanted this shot to play out. It was, uh, it was planned that there was a pan down from the Red Comet uh, down to Danny's Kalasar in the Red Waist, a lot of emptiness around them. The plates were shot in Croatia. They were shot in a quarry. And uh, it was clear that we would have to add scope to it. So most of that ended up being a, a matte painting. We used uh, many pictures of desert landscapes and we created our own very specific red waste. There were lots of very specific ideas what calf had to be. We knew we were going to have to produce a lot of matte paintings and add a lot of castles to the background. There's a long scene where Danny and the Kalasar meet the rulers of Karth and they want to get inside. And for this scene we had a location in Croatia and uh, in one direction there was a bit of a wall built and we knew we had to extend it. We also knew we had this shot where the doors would open and we would see Karth. It's got to be an incredibly wealthy city. It's got to be imposing in its size. And for a shot that's completely manufactured from nothing, I, th I think it's really quite, quite beautiful. It would be an honor to host you at the House of the Undying. You are always welcome, mother of dragons. The House of the Undying is a strange and creepy place in the city of Karth and is something that's completely fabricated. We added the CG tower in, in, in the background and Dan and David felt it should be a very large tower with little features, no entrance really. A weird tower that when you go inside, you see larger spaces inside than what you would expect from outside. Danny and the House of the Undying was a somewhat complicated setup because there's a lot of different elements that come together. It's, of course, it's a room which was a live action location in Dubrovnik. Uh, and the limitations and challenges of shooting in a historical environment, you can't set fire to it. You know, you can trash the set you've built, but you can't trash a historical 
room in a castle. So we have pi of pre in the room, but then pi of pre multiplies himself many times. We've got these three dragons that need to interact with her. So what we do when we shoot that is we have stuffies that are positioned on the table. We need to see fire, so because we can't actually shoot with fire, we have reactive lighting that throws flame-colored light along the walls. And then we culminate in seeing pi of pre over the back of Danny on fire. Some of the shots were just combinations of different elements. There were elements of Danny in front of green screen standing there and her arms are chained. And then we have an element of the stuntman that was set on fire. And then we have some CG background that is a stone wall of the room. And we're adding fire to the stuntman. And those elements, Pyre Pre on fire, Danny with reactive lighting, any number of shots of the room from every conceivable angle, the CG generated dragons and the CG generated fire. All of those pieces are put together like a puzzle. One of the interesting creative challenges of season two was coming up with a variety of new worlds that didn't exist yet in season one. And uh, of course, everyone who's a fan of the book has in their mind's eye what Dragonstone looks like, and what Pike looks like, and what Harrenhal looks like. Harrenhal's a really interesting castle for us because it's incredibly huge, beyond measure. It's enormous, and it's uh, a ruin because it's been laid waste to by dragon fire. And when Arya and Hot Pie and Gendry come around the corner and look up at it, it's got to be something that says this thing is beyond huge. What kind of fire melts stone? Dragon fire. It's destroyed, it's haunted. So we added elements to the establishing shots of Helen Hall that would make it look a little bit more creepy and where you would still read that this this melted stone. That was kind of a, a challenge to bring out the melted stone aspect. There was a lot of back and forth. How much did we want to show the melted stone? Of course, the more you melt it, the more it, it looks artificial, and we we wanted it still to read as a, as a believable object. We have this shot from Tywin's chamber, from his point of view, where you're looking out at Harrenhal from above, and then the camera pulls back and you're inside his chamber, and you just, for the first time, get the sense of how enormous it really is. Harold the Black thought this castle would be his legacy. Greatest fortress ever built. Look at it now, a blasted ruin. And then we get to an environment, a world that doesn't now exist, called Pike. And we have Theon arriving at Pike. We shoot Theon on a ship that was built in a parking lot. And around the sides of it, we introduce an ocean. Then you cut to an over on Theon looking at what? We shot some plate photography off the coast of Northern Ireland that had some rock structures that looked like they would tie into Pike. We got like a camera crew on, on a ship and we decided to go past the rock structures and then we just extended these rocks and made them larger and then put the castle structures on top. When the shot of Pike was finished, David looked at it and said, you know, there's a fellow sitting on a horse in front of what is the gate going to Pike. I think he's facing the wrong way. He saw that it was facing in. If someone is just standing there, he should be facing out because he's obviously a guard. So we flipped that guard around and now he's facing the right way. We were shooting a scene the other day um, where me and Yara are on the horse walking along the beach and the special effects guy just came up to us and just went, look, look, this is your castle here. And he just clicked a button on it and the castle just sort of appeared onto the side of the cliff. And seeing that was just even more amazing than what I imagined. And then we get to King's Landing. King's Landing is the capital of Westeros, and it has some unique features that are represented a bunch of different ways in our uh, approach to season two and in our visual effects work. In episode nine for the Battle of Blackwater Bay, 
That's actually a set piece that was built, and that is tied into other bits of King's Landing that we play in Dubrovnik by using visual effects. We see the Red Keep in the distance, we see some fortification in the other distance, and in 209 we now see a new location as part of the defensive structures around King's Landing, and when we look in one direction we want to see something that we saw before. You see this vast view of ships, most of which will be shot around one ship and then turned into a CG model that will be multiplied many times to create Stannis's and uh, Davos's fleet. We wanted the 3D ships that we would add in the, in the distance to look similar to, to the ship in the foreground. And we also knew we would have to extend the, the set ship in some of the shots. We also had to put it in CG water. It was built on land and we would have to put some water around it. For the CG fleet, we uh, created duplicates of, of the foreground model with slight uh, variations in it. Then we created the, this layout of Stannis' attacking fleet. Wildfire! Steer clear! Steer clear! Wildfire is something that had to be done through visual effects and it's just, I think, very good that we have people like Reiner Dombos and all capable of creating these flames that look real despite the fact that their color is not at all like real fire. You kind of go into it thinking you know what's going to be hard and thinking like the dragons are going to be the really hard thing to pull off and, and not realizing that something like the color of the wildfire is going to be really challenging. We went through a, a bit of an R&D process. How should the wildfire look? You know, how luminous should it be? How much green? We looked at some napalm explosions. We thought that that was, that was kind of fiery energy that we, that we wanted there. And there we also see these, these tentacles coming out of the core of the explosion. The flames also have to have a certain coloring and a certain quality and a certain height. We want to have a lot of spectacle and we want to show a little bit of a, of a magical element in, in the wildfire. The Fist of the First Men is shot in Iceland. It is a combination of live action photography that is unbelievably breathtaking scenery. But one of the things that it doesn't in its real location provide is you don't get the sense that it's a high fortress that's really impossible to get to. And so that was our job in visual effects. There are also some shots where we shot on top of the fist of the first man and uh, there was actually there was water in the distance, it was the, the sea. So we then added more Frostfang Mountains in the distance. The clouds that we had in, in the background of these shots that we shot from the fist of the first man looked, ended up looking very artificial. On one day we just had clouds that looked like nuclear explosions, like mushroom clouds, but we didn't work on, the, on these clouds. We, they're just there. Mance Raider's camp is following Jon Snow and Egret over the crest of a hill and looking down into a valley. And that valley is filled with an immense city of tents and people. And you won't see all of that, but you'll see that it's vast. And uh, you'll, you'll have to wait till uh, season three before you get a close-up look at it. The climax shot to the season, really, is, uh, is this impressive pullback from Samwell to the White Walker to seeing the fist of the first men and the camera revealing a vast army of undead that are descending on the fist of the first men. And it's a pretty impressive shot that was shot in part in Iceland using environments that were photographed in Iceland. Uh, and also was shot on stage. We knew it was going to be a long shot. It's going to be a pullback that was a much longer pullback than the stage would allow us to do. And we also wanted to duplicate the extras that we had on, on that day to make it look like a large army. The White Walker is sitting on a horse. We had a perfectly alive, healthy horse and we put some tracking markers on the horse so that we can add CG wounds to the horse. All we're doing really on, on these white walkers is we're adding the blue eyes and uh, we thought that would be a nice effect if the white walkers emitting cold so we're going to have a bit of an effect on their arms this cold coming from the white walkers they bring the cold with them so we show this horse the white walker camera is tracking back and in the distance we see 
uh, the fist of the first man, which is part of the digital environment that we're adding. As a visual effects producer, it makes me really proud and excited when I can be asked, what's my favorite visual effect for the season? And that's a really hard one to answer. I'm enormously proud of the work we've done here. I think the dragons and the, and the team that did the CG animation on them did a brilliant job. I think some of our map painting work is extraordinary. I think Pike is gorgeous and it looks like a real place to me. When we go out and we're in the middle of the sea battle and we're seeing the Hulk ship explode, it just makes me go, wow. So I'm not just working on the show, I'm also an incredible fan of it. And that's one of the greatest privileges.